Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the CR Sports Podcast. Garrett, I'm not going to waste any time. Look at it right here. Look at this. The team of the century. You go back to the 1990s. That's when the Yankees were in their heyday. And it's been a while since they've even been back to the World Series. 15 years, 2009. The first time that I can remember one of my teams going to a championship game. I'm I'm just so I've been soaking in. I've been on cloud nine since last night. I, I haven't been so happy from a sports event in my entire life. The Yankees are the American League champions, and we're going to see who they face off. They got the Dodgers and the Mets game six tonight out in L.A. But, Garrett, I am on cloud nine. I, there's nobody that can stop me. I, I've never felt so good about some sports event in my entire life. Yeah, Yankees probably the biggest headline of yesterday's sports world. But there was a lot of headlines as, you know, we're getting into the swing of things with college football. The NFL is starting to ramp up as well. Some teams are separating themselves from the rest of the field as we got a Super Bowl rematch going on right now between the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. And then the Yankees still waiting to see, like you mentioned, who they will meet in the national in the World Series is the National League Championship Series. Game six out in L.A. takes place in just under an hour as Sean Manaya and the Mets go up against the Dodgers who are starting Michael Kopech, but it'll be more of a bullpen game uh, tonight. It's There's a lot going on. The, the Super Bowl rematch isn't really being played like a Super Bowl rematch. It's kind of sloppy on both sides, but... It, I, I, I've just never been so happy. And uh, let's start with it, the, the Yankee game from last night, because that's the biggest news in sports right now. And we got to talk about the baseball playoffs. You know, this as much as, as happy as I am, of course, I'm going to I'm going to tell you the truth. This is this is what should have happened. The, the correct result did did occur. The Yankees were the much better team than Cleveland. They, they, they're an inferior American League Central. And the Yankees, if they didn't make it to the World Series, everyone would be screaming disappointment. And they should have gotten there, and they did. But it's it's the moves that have been made, and people have come out to hate on Brian Cashman, hate on Aaron Boone numerous times. But you have to acknowledge the moves that Brian Cashman made in the offseason with getting Juan Soto, bringing him here, and then Juan Soto hitting, having one of the greatest at-bats I've ever seen in my entire life. He just fought off pitch after pitch after pitch, sitting fastball the entire time, said, throw me a fastball. He eventually got what he wanted, hit it out to center field, right center field, and it was it was, it was was good night, Irene, as the Yankees said. And then they came out and closed it out with Luke Weaver, who's been a gem for them. And Aaron Boone made all the right bullpen moves throughout this postseason so far, but the Yankees are moving on, and I think the people that usually get hated on, Boone, Cashman, they're the first people that people want to kill them. They want to kill them when everything goes bad, but you know what? It's going really well right now, and you got to give them their flowers. Yeah, it was it was an interesting series because it felt like, for the most part, you know, it didn't feel like it was a five game series just because the Guardians were sort of in every game. You know, the Yankees didn't really just jump out of the gates and blow them out at all. The Guardians were only able to end up winning one of those games, which they did in extra innings. One of the one of the better games of the series, but you know, there's a couple games that went to extra innings in Cleveland, a great atmosphere as as well as it was in New York with the new 2-3-2 format that they've been using. So the Yankees were able to close out last night in Cleveland. But, you know, the Yankees are just superior to the Guardians in a lot of the ways. I mean, they have the superior payroll. They have the superior bats in the lineup. They just they just have a more talented lineup. And the Yankees win and play differently than the Guardians do. The Guardians, you know, they try to score two or three runs, scrape together four or five innings from a starter, and then turn it over to that bullpen, which – during the regular season, it was the most dominant bullpen in the league, and it looked like maybe of the century. It was their bullpen was just absolutely ridiculous. They had four guys with an under two ERA, but you saw as you know the Yankees were able to get to the starters a little earlier, and then they were able to get to Tanner Bybee in the sixth inning with the Giancarlo Stanton two run home run yesterday. Well, the more you make those Guardians pitchers throw the relievers, all of a sudden they started throwing high leverage situations day in and day out, and it's taxing as you saw. And the Yankees were able to. Uh, take advantage of that can we can we talk about that by uh pitching to stanton in the sixth inning why why did that happen what in, in steven vote's eyes vogue's eyes why did i don't understand what he's seeing is he seeing something different than i've seen because john carlos stan up to that point had three home runs in this series and was just mashing he's been terrific and i don't know i don't i don't understand the 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 game plan the pitching to him there did, did you th- see it the same way that i did I mean, it's hard to, you know, blame a manager when Bybee had went, whatever it was, five and a third, five and two thirds with no earned runs. 
and it wasn't they were only up two runs still so I think he realized that Tanner Bybee had it going yesterday and he wanted to see how far he could ride him obviously looking back on it now he probably should have you know went to Cade Smith or someone else but the guys I thought in the they should have intentionally walked him. yeah that's another another possibility Chisholm Chisholm's been struggling like crazy right behind yeah Chisholm, Chisholm did not have a very good series but It's it's tough when, you know, the Guardians bullpen hasn't been as dominant as it was. Maybe he lost a little bit of faith and, you know, he realized maybe he was looking for the possibly into game six or game seven. I know you can't do that when you're facing elimination, but I with a base open or even if there's not a base open, I mean, Stan has eight hits in the postseason against the Guardians. and They're all home runs. So he had the opportunity there. You know, a single is not going to hurt you as much. Giancarlo Stan's a lot more dangerous to hit a home run than Jazz Chisholm is up next. So. You know, obviously, looking back on it now, Stephen Vogt's probably second guessing his decision, but I don't know. It's Bybee, you can't really hang a hang a curveball either. So that's that's a good point. And and the catcher uh, behind the plate was it was Naylor last night, I believe, um, for the Guardians instead of Hedges, and they he set up. on the outside he didn't want he did not want that pitch down the middle it was a complete miss by Bybee and Stanton's done what he did all series long he's American League championship championship series MVP rightfully so he made he made him pay and he has just been so terrific we were talking about this beforehand the move in 2018 after the 2017 season in which the Yankees lost in game seven of the ALCS to the Astros turns out the Astros were cheating we found out that a couple of years later And it was like, oh, they were so close. And they go out to get the National League MVP, hits over 50 homers. You bring in Giancarlo Stan with a, after a rookie year, Aaron Judge, in which I think he should have won the Rookie of the Year award and the MVP. But he didn't. Astros cheating. Another thing that we could talk about. But we don't need to because they bring they bring in Stan and people are saying, oh, here it is. The Bronx Bombers, they're going to go out. They should win. They should go to the World Series. They should win the World Series. They should win a couple championships. They should have a dynasty now. And that never really seemed to happen. It was injury plagued by on both sides with Judge and Stanton. And the the same thing, though, the consistency with this is that Stan has always performed in the postseason in New York. When he, when he come, even if it was a wild card game or wherever they were, other guys wouldn't hit at all at always, but he would always perform. So I would look at that and just be like, this guy's clutch. And he when he gets on hot streaks, he's hotter than anybody in baseball. It's almost it's almost insane. And when he gets on cold streaks, he's almost colder than anyone in baseball. He looks similar to Javi Baez. But what he's able to do in the playoffs is just incredible. And it finally culminated this year. And I think the addition of Soto was also another big thing. And they were all able to stay healthy to into the postseason. Stanton wasn't even healthy the whole season. He missed a lot of the year. And it's it just it's just crazy how it really worked out. And I think that from from a place where Yankee fans once booed John Carlo in his first home series in 2018, that you gotta you gotta give this man all the credit in the world. He is a winner. He's a true competitor. Even last night, after getting the American League uh, Championship Series MVP, he says, "This isn't the trophy I want. I want the next one." And he just had that like that killer mentality in the playoffs. really really like any greats in sports that's what that's what i'm referencing to he he's he sounded like kobe bryant he sounded like Derek cheater he sounded like michael jordan he he really has that killer mentality and the guy has been clutcher than clutch and i want to give john carlos stan all the credit in the world because he's been hated on for a very long time in new york yeah i think you gotta uh, relax a little bit with comparing him to guys like kobe mj the references he says i, I when they were up three one he goes i don't care He goes, we got to win the next one. That's not well, what Kobe said. for the for the press conference, I guess you could say they're similar, but I'll I'll take the word you said consistency, and that's not really something you can use to describe Stan's tenure with the Yankees. He's missed a lot of games due to injury. When he's been on the field, he has been effective, and especially in the postseason, he's been able to do a lot of damage, uh, hitting four home runs in just five games in this series. You know, it's you kind of need that from him because he's not he's not doing anything else base hits wise. He is. Like I mentioned, all of his hits against the Guardians in the postseason have been home runs. So he really does rely on that power. But when he gets it going, and I think the main reason that it was so effective is because the Yankees also had guys on base out in front of him. So they were turning those solo shots into two or three run shots, which when you're facing a team like the Guardians, you know, one, two or three run home run is it's really going to swing the way the game's going just because of the lack of offense on the other end. And, you know, besides Stephen Kwan and Rokio and the nine Rokio batting ninth and then Quan batting one. You know, the Guardians didn't have many guys putting together great at bats. I know 
David Fry, big Christmas had, you know, pretty much one good swing the whole series. I mean, he, he hit a couple pretty far foul, but besides the walk up or the two run game tying home run, he did, he wasn't very effective. And Jose Ramirez didn't show up as we've seen him in prior post seasons. And then in this regular season, like the way we expected him to, and, you know, Judge was getting slandered in the Royal series, but I think he really improved his performance in the one, two, three punch, sort of the big three in New York really showed up. And then other guys were able to, you know, step up and just do their jobs. You know, Torres, Volpe, guys who, you know, they weren't they didn't hit multiple home runs in the series, but they were on base so that when Soto, Judge and Stan did hit home runs, you know, they were driving in other guys as well. And Garrett, I'm trying to find a stat right here, but. There's a there's a stat. It's about 35, 36 games that Stanton's played in the postseason. And it's all it's all been with New York. Right. And he has, I think, 15 or 16 home runs, which is more if he's either tied with Babe Ruth with the amount of home runs is in his little games ever. Or he's he's in front of him now after the home run up last night. What he's doing is history. What he's doing is is in the grades of postseason performance. What he's doing is if the Yankees didn't have. Reggie Jackson named Mr. October. I'm telling you, Giancarlo Stanton is well on his way to getting that title. But if, if with a big if, they need to go win the World Series, and there's still four more game, there's still four more games that they have to win this postseason. But I'm not worried about that right now. They don't even know who they're playing yet. Regardless, he's been incredible. But I really wanted to mention something too, and I want to hear your thoughts on this. When the Yankees went out to get Soto, in the first game of the series they had was in Houston this year. We know that we know the history with the Yankees in Houston in in the American League Championship Series in the ALCS. The, the Houston's knocked them out in 17, knocked them out in 19 and swept them in 2022. What 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 we saw in the, the first three game series with Juan Soto the fir- his first games not in pinstripes because they were on the road, but his first games with a Yankee uniform, we saw a different approach than what I've been accustomed to seeing as a Yankee fan. What Soto was able to do Against Josh Hader in the one of the first few games of the season in this first series, he fought, he fought, he fought, and I vividly remembered it last night when he was up in the tenth inning. He fought, he fought, he fought, fouled off pitches, and finally came through and got a base hit. In past seasons, the Yankees do not get a hit there. It just, it just feels like it, it just doesn't happen. It's against the Astros. It's on the road. They're really close. It's like, oh, they they fought their way through. But then there's this guy Juan Soto who's like. No, I'm a winner. I won a World Series at 20 years old. Yeah, I, I know what to do. I'm only 25. Yeah, I've been playing since in the big league since I was 19. He goes, I know what I'm doing. And he got a hit. And I go, and I was telling myself that last night. And I'm speaking it out loud. I'm trying to ha- speak it into fruition, right? And I go, this is exactly like the beginning of the season, se- beginning of the season. And I just have a feeling he's going to come through. He, the guy is just a winner. He, can, he it, it, That's what you need on championship teams. That's what you need to get the championships. And it's really incredible to watch. It's it's really rare, and it's a quote from Aaron Boone in the post game yesterday, where he said, "You just kind of exp- they at- Meredith Morakovitz, uh, the Yes Network reporter, asked him, were you shocked? Like, what you what were you thinking? Were you shocked to see how it goes?' He goes, like, I-, I wasn't shocked. It's crazy to say that, but the guy comes through for us. He's a player. He's a hitter. He's a winner, and he's clutch. And that is really what he did. And it was just incredible to watch Juan Soto have one of the biggest hits." of the past 15 years for the Yankees. Yeah. And I think he's a little different than uh, the other two out of the big three and judge and Stan and the respective, he's going to work the count a little bit more. He's a lot more patient up there. He's going to draw, you know, I know judge does a great job of drawing walks as well, but he's really going to draw more walks. He's going to make pitchers work. He's going to, you know, he's going to force 10 pitch at bats, 10 plus pitch at bats where he just, you know, it feels like a pitcher just can't throw a pitch by him. I think that identity is sort of something that edge that the Yankees have missed in past couple of years. You know, they had these guys who were just going up there, hitting home runs. All of a sudden, they would get in a slump, and Yankee Stadium starts booing them. And then there's this controversial. And like you mentioned, Soto's like, I've been here. I've done this before. I've already won a World Series with the Nationals. I know what it takes, and it's not home run or bust. The home runs are definitely big in the postseason, but sometimes you get just got to scrape together good at bats. And I think what makes him so special is he can sort of be whatever he wants to be at the plate if you need him to draw a walk he can do just that if you need him to hit a big home run he can do that if you need him you know to work a pitcher deep into the count and just slap a base hit the other way he's capable of doing that as well which I think is something that you know Aaron Boone and this Yankees team they weren't really built like that 
So to go out and acquire somebody like that this offseason, it's paid off so far. But we got to talk about the other league as well. In the the National League, it's in the playoffs, there's been a lot more runs scored in the National League than there were in the American League. It's been a lot less about pitching and more about the powerful bats. And I think whatever way this series goes, we're going to have an amazing World Series. It's either going to be a Subway Series to crown a World Series champion, or it's going to be, you know, the old New York rivalry, the old Brooklyn Dodgers moving out to L.A. versus probably, you know, showcasing the two best guys in the MLB between Shohei and Aaron Judge. Yeah, it's it's definitely going to be a tough matchup either way for the Yankees. And it, it'll be it'll be a very entertaining one. They're going to they're going to get ratings on this World Series. Let's just say that. I think, Garrett, do we say this in the during the summer that the that the MLB is rooting for a Dodgers Yankees World Series? Or we said that once Shohei was traded. They, well, okay. I think it comes at a time too when they're coming off a of Rangers Diamondbacks World Series, yeah. which is not exactly going to get the best rating. That's, that's when we said it. I think we said the it. The MLB last. really the MLB really needed this rating wise. Whether I mean, listen, I'm an Orioles fan. They're in the same division as the Yankees. I was not rooting for the Yankees, but I will admit. Just getting getting up to watch a Mets Guardians or a Dodgers Guardians World Series this game not as exciting as Mets Yankees or Dodgers Yankees. Yeah, I I think we talked about it last year, I believe, right? I I, I think that we were like, yeah, it's it's a cool storyline with the Rangers and the Diamondbacks, but we're looking at the numbers. It's not drawing anybody else in outside of baseball junkies, right? Or well, I mean, fans. look at you look at March Madness. Everyone loves a good Cinderella story, or most people, if it's not your team getting upset, loves a good Cinderella story. When it gets to the Final Four, we want to see Kentucky, we want to see Duke, we want to see North Carolina. I don't really want to see those teams, but that's what draws the ratings, right? Look at the college football playoff. Alabama and Georgia, those are the teams drawing in the ratings. These Cinderella teams, yeah, they're fun, but there's going to be a lot more people watching if the Yankees are in than if the Guardians are in. And the MLB is trying to keep up with the NBA and the NFL as those major sports and, you know, to have a showdown like the subway series or show versus judge and the Yankees versus the Dodgers, that's really going to help promote the game. Yeah. What do you think would get more ratings Yankees Dodgers or Yankees Mets? I think Yankees Dodgers by a, I don't want to say a large amount, but a significant amount because, because instead of just being New York, it's cross country. And there's, well, I think just because, I mean, Aaron judge has been the AL MVP for the past couple of years. It is and a great storyline. Yeah. Shohei's been so dominant in LA. And it used to be the Brooklyn Dodgers. They used to both be in New York. And now, you know, the Dodgers moving out west sort of renews that rivalry. And it's the two number one seeds, the teams that have been the best teams in the regular season in their conference, finally would get to match up in the World Series, which I think would be just absolutely amazing. And you know, we talked about it in the past with and everyone kind of says it with baseball playoffs. Oh, it's a crab shoot. Whoever you just get you just got to get in. That's what it was with the Diamondbacks last year. That's what it is with the Mets right now. They caught fire at the right time, and we'll see. I mean, it's game six. The Dodgers were up 3-1. The Mets won the last game in game five to force game, force game six tonight, and we'll see what happens. But if the Mets could force a game seven, and possibly if they would go on to win the next two games and they make this great comeback, again, we're saying in the, in the National League especially, it's catching fire at the right time. That's what it means, and – the Yankees were they they shut down the Royals. They proved that, and they they beat the Guardians, who were the two seed. So it wasn't really the sa- same case in the American League. But uh, yeah, I mean, but the story. Tigers, the Tigers, the six seed, they had a lead in Game Five against the Guardians, and they beat the Astros too. That no one really thought they were gonna do. Were, I mean, the the Tigers were a few innings away from the six seed being in the in the ALCS. So it really. I mean, the Mets late ending heroics from Cleveland with really. one with one day to go in the regular season. The Mets didn't even know if they were going to be in the postseason. Yeah, and now, they're two, and now they're two wins away from you know a World Series. But we could sort of break down Game Six, like I mentioned. It's going to be Manaya, and what a cool story Manaya is. I mean, he's he's been a solid MLB vet for a little bit now. But you hear the story. All of a sudden, he was watching Chris Sale pitch once, and he's like, "I want to try out that arm angle." All of a sudden. He's got a sub three ERA and he's mowing through lineups in the postseason. It's like, why doesn't everyone just do that? Kind of makes you sound like, well, what does he know that we don't? But Manaya has been electrifying the crowd at City Field and electrifying, you know, his own team, firing them up with these performances. You see the guys wearing the eye black now to support each other for the Mets. They did it for Manaya and then for Severino. It feels like, you know, this is this is a team who's got, you know, got things going their way and they're on fire, but at the same time, 
the Dodgers are the team that's one win away with a lot, a lot of superpower in that lineup. You know what's kind of stunk about this series, though? It's like all games have been blowouts. Either yeah. both wins for the Mets, blowouts, they beat the Dodgers, they jump on them early, and then both wins, or all three wins for the Dodgers, excuse me, they've all been blowouts too. It's the complete opposite of what we saw in the ALCS. But I want to talk about, everyone was talking about going into the series, the Dodgers starting pitching. It isn't good. It's not good enough. Well, you got a really unbelievable start from Walker Bueller the other night. And, and the Dodgers, when they're on, like we've seen, when their starting pitching is on, it's they blow them out. They've blown out the Mets. So that's really the question of what are we going to get tonight? But I have faith in Sean in Manaya Garrett, because like you mentioned, he has been terrific. He's been incredible. It's It's been a real bounce back. Um, I mean, he was a good pitcher before, but not not at this level. So the, the Mets feel like they got they really got a guy uh, in him, and they, they're very confident in that. But you cannot turn it over to the, this Dodger bullpen with a lead because this bullpen is very good, and and that's that's if that happens tonight. Let's say that's a two run lead for the Dodgers, and, it, and we're going in the seventh inning with the and going they're going to their bullpen, and their, their bullpen's already been in. I I wouldn't feel super confident. I know the Mets have had some. They've had late inning heroics as we were just talking about that, but I don't know. Maybe, 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 maybe it will happen one more time or a couple more times. Maybe the magic is still alive, but it, it'll be it's it'll be interesting against this bullpen. Yeah, the Dodgers are going to be they're going to be facing the Dodgers bullpen from inning one. <laughs> yeah, Michael Kopech's getting the ball, so it's going to be a bullpen game. I think what's been so effective for the Dodgers is you mentioned how good Bueller was, but also Jack Flaherty's game one start. If they get two starts like that just in a series, they were able to shut the Mets out in both those games. So because they're really only a three starter team, right? Yeah. I mean, Yamamoto, it's pretty much Flaherty, Yamamoto, and Bueller at this point. And if they make the World Series, we could even see that go down to two starters, possibly, with I don't know if they would trust completely all three of those guys. But when they get two starts like that, it almost feels like it's unfair. They get shutouts and then their bullpen's well rested. And now you know, a bullpen game is almost like better than having to start somebody, one of their starters, because they haven't been as reliable. But to me, it's just been the offense and how hot they've been. Originally, it was the story of Shohei Otani with uh, guys on base. He had a stretch where he was 17 for his last 20, hitting with guys on base. That's insane. Yeah, that is, it's completely ridiculous. And even the last couple games, you know, he's he showed up a little more without guys on base and he's gotten it going. Max Muncy had a 12 at bat appearance i think of reaching base he's like a home runner a walk every plate appearance it feels like mookie Betts is starting to get it going you know kk hernandez has 15 home runs in the postseason just completely like i saw a stat earlier this postseason that that was more than judge at one point which i know judge is still on the younger side but for somebody like kk hernandez to have 15 postseason home runs is pretty ridiculous and teoscar hernandez hasn't even been playing that well so there's just so much depth. You mentioned guys like Tommy Edmond down at the bottom of the lineup. This Dodgers lineup is really tough to get through. And you last game they they put up six runs. They just they gave up twelve, which is the reason that game was a blowout. But it's really hard to silence this Dodgers offense. Yeah, I I think I I really do think that the Mets if they if they wanted to to be to feel confident they'd have to be up three two right now. I think it would have to be reversed. Um, I just I feel like two games at Dodger Stadium and the Dodgers only have to win one. It yeah. just doesn't it doesn't feel so great to me. And because I'd be confident if the Mets were like, okay, we just have to win one game. They just got to split. I think the yeah. Mets can do that. But to win two in a row, I think it'll be really tough. I, so I am picking the Dodgers to move on to the World Series. I just think that's going to happen. And you know, it's how many? What's the percentage? There's a stat on this, Garrett, where a team's up three one in a series and they go on to win eighty some percent of the time. But you know, the Mets have magic this year. They've got Grimace, they've got the Rizzler, they've got Hawk Tua going to the games. They got everybody. And maybe, maybe, maybe this is the year of the Mets where they just get to the World Series somehow and they're gonna win the next two games at Dodger Stadium. And maybe they'll blow up the bullpen tonight. Yeah, and we sort of look for that October hero, you know, every year making his name. And it's it might be Mark Vientos this year with the way he's been batting for the Mets. He's been unbelievable. Guys like Lindor, Alonzo with a big home run last night. He hasn't been as good as you know advertised maybe but he's the reason they're here right now with that big three run jack against the brewers in game three of that wild card series but just back to mark vientos he's been amazing i i do not think the mets thought they were going to get this much you know from him production 
first year at third base and he's just slid into that two spot or three spot and he's been unbelievable. Look around the infield. They didn't think they were going to get that out of Jose Iglesias either. What they what a season he's had. Um also, not to mention top hit song. Oh my god. Uh it was you know, now he's gonna have a song with Pitbull that's about to drop. If Mets make the World Series, maybe he drops it or it comes out soon. But they've had a lot of like things this season that weren't planned out to be so great. Um it they were all in on 2025. That's all we heard from this Mets team. This is all we heard. Um but they get, they went out and got David Stearns, their GM, and you know, Cohen is saying they were basically like, Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be all in on 2025. And now they're two games away from they're in game six of the NLCS and they're two wins away from the world series. They're really close. It's just, I it does it not work out this year, but uh, either, either way, you got to be confident in this Mets team now moving forward in the future. <laughs> and Garrett, what, what is, what is it up with uh, when after Buck Showalter leaves a place, um, it kind of just works out well for the, the team. They get, they get really close to the world series and maybe the Mets will make it. And that streak will continue. Yeah, I don't know. Something's something's up, but great job by, you know, the new manager just coming in, stepping in. They were 11 games under 500 at one yeah. point. Carlos Mendoza, who used to be the yeah, Yankees. Mendoza. They didn't, the Yankees he, didn't want to lose him. Yeah. And now he's, you know, he's got his team two wins away from the World Series. But I guess we'll we'll touch on a little football. I know right now it feels like, you know, with the World Series looming, it's baseball time. But we are in full swing, both college and NFL we like to focus a little more on NFL. We talked about the Super Bowl rematch, the Chiefs prevailing in that one, 28 to 18. Neither quarterback looked very sharp. And, you know, you mentioned it last podcast, Michael. It's been the year of the running back. Today was a rough day for quarterbacks around the league. It just felt like that all year, kind of. I don't know. I, I feel like this has been, I mean, I mentioned it last time. It's been almost a month, probably, since we've done a podcast. It's been a few weeks. And, uh, we didn't do one in October yet, and it's just kind of continued the same trend. Uh, you look at what the Lions are doing, that Jared Goff isn't a world beater. I mean, he had that 18-for-18 18 18 game, but for the most part, it's the two-headed monster in Montgomery and Gibbs. It's it's guys around the league like Saquon going to the Eagles. It's it, it's a run. It's a running. It's a run first league, it feels like, around. It feels like it's a run to set up the pass. It's a run to set up play action. And if you, it's a copycat league. We've said this before. Everyone's kind of tr- trying to copy – the Shanahan model and it works. It's the play action pass. It's the McVay model. It's the, have the, these young minds. It's Ben Johnson. Now Uh, it's O'Connell in, in Minnesota. It, it, this is what they do. And you know, it's uh, whatever you want to say about it. It's, it, it's a run first league. It feels like right now. And that's, that's something that's been different Garrett. Yeah. I think it's still team dependent, obviously, but with the, the Vikings losing today earlier to the Lions. You mentioned how good the Lions have looked. Those two teams sitting at five and one. The NFC North looking like the best division in football right now. Yeah. With Lions and Vikings at five and one. The Packers five and two. The Bears sitting at four and two. And they're in last place in that division right yeah. now. Isn't that a surprise for Chicago? I mean, they Caleb Williams didn't look that great in the very beginning of the season, and he's really bounced back and looked a lot better. So that's yeah, and I think. I think for Bears fans and just for fans overall around the league, it's been more exciting the last couple of weeks. You know, the Bears were like two and one after three weeks. You know, they had a winning record, but Williams wasn't doing too much. But he's really put it together the last couple of weeks. And I think that's when people are going to actually take the Bears seriously is, you know, when Caleb Williams is looking more like a threat at the number one pick. And it's going to be a showdown next week when the Bears go to Washington to take on Jaden Daniels and the five and two commanders, number two overall pick, although his status is uncertain now after a rib injury earlier. But, Michael, you're a Cowboys fan, and, you know, the Cowboys, they have an uphill battle right now with the the Eagles and Commanders off to nice starts. Yeah, so from going from the top of the world in one one of my teams to the absolute bottom kind of pit of the earth right now is how I feel as a Dallas Cowboys fan because not only, you know, they're three – look at the record. They're three and three. Okay. That's – they're 500. That's fine. You want to talk about – one of the most disgusting actions that Jerry Jones has ever made in his tenure as the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, when he went on 105 through the fan and he just absolutely berated those guys and was like, oh, don't ask me tough questions. Don't, don't ask me that. Uh, Jerry, that, he goes, that's not your job. I, I, he's calling for the job. He's threatening to get him fired. I go, Jerry, 
you know what? How how dare you, really? I mean, he's asking a reporter after the game because he has to have his his press conference after the game because that's what every owner in the league does, right, Garrett? Every owner in the league has a press conference after the game. No, he's the only one that does it because he wants he wants the attention, he wants the clicks, he wants the likes, he wants the tweets, he wants it all. He wants all the attention, he wants all the media. So after the game, they're asking him, uh, you know, how do you, how do you feel about this team, or do you feel like you should have made more offseason moves? Which is which is a simple, which is honestly a fair question since they. Uh, they don't have any running game. They they look awful. They got blown out in the worst home loss in Jerry Jones's ownership of the Cowboys against the Lions. And he's like, or no, they were at, and they were also at. The, this is where I'm talking about. They asked him, "You thinking about uh, making a coaching change? You know, the Jets just fired Robert Sala out of nowhere, and they, you know, it's not like their whole season was already gone. They just fired him out of nowhere." You know, teams can, it doesn't happen a lot, but teams can make moves during the season. And after the worst loss in franchise history under Jerry Jones uh, at home, and they've been, they've lost now four straight games at home dating back to the playoff game from a year ago. You you, you look at them and you say, uh, th- whatever reason, every team scores, scores over 40 points at home against you. So there's something going on and you look terrible. And he goes, he goes, no, do you think I'm an idiot? Well, I don't know, Jerry. I, I I mean, do you, do I think you're an idiot? If I was if I was that reporter and he questions me that, I'd go, oh, I don't I don't I don't think you're an idiot as a person, but I think some of the moves we've made have been idiotic. I really do because we didn't go out and get anybody in free agency. We we we're acting like that there's no issue. We like our guys. We signed Ezekiel Elliott instead of instead of signing Derrick Henry for just a little bit more money. Think we've made some dumb moves. So that's that that's the thing that it just it's just making my skin crawl. I I don't. I've never in my life hated being a Cowboys fan so much as I do right now. Uh, never in my life have, been, have I been so close from jumping off. Never in my life have I been so close from just saying, you know what? I, I don't want anything to do with this organization right now. I don't want to watch. I don't want to do anything with them. I don't want to root for them. And and I'm, and I'm not making that move in my life, Garrett, but I've never in my life have I been so close. It's really disheartening to see what's happened from this team, what's happened to this team. And, you know, Let's just throw out money to C.D. Lamb and have him really not perform and not be like the guy that we expected him to be. Let's just throw sixty million a year to Dak and a, a, a guy that I love with no help for him though. But what, what are we? What are we doing with a defense that is absolutely terrible? Let's bring in Mike Zimmer, who was bad in his last year in, Min- in Minnesota, had one of the worst defenses in the league, and just stink it up some more. It's 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 disheartening. It's like why do I root at this point? Why do I watch? And it's it, they're they're a terrible team. They're gonna go on. Maybe they'll win some games. They'll win against bad teams like they've done this year. That's all you'll see from them. I guess they'll, I guess they'll win on the road and they'll lose every game at home because that's how it's been. But this isn't a good football team. This is a bad football team. I don't expect them to make the playoffs, and I think the Commanders are going to win the division in the NFC East. Yeah, sw- a switch up from you know, how you usually talk about the Cowboys. Usually it's I- I'm telling you, but- never in my life I've been so negative about them. I'm usually nothing, optimistic. It's usually nothing but praise for the Cowboys, how they're going to win the Super Bowl, and how they're going to never lose another football game. I never That's the best quarterback in the league. CD's the best wide receiver. CD's Jerry stupid. Jones, Jerry Jones, you know, he's not a great manager, but I've never said anything. I've never said any I've never said greatest about Jerry in any well, conversation. You know, Jerry's world isn't looking like a very tough place to play right now. That's for sure. Is might want to call it, you know, the lion Lions world after last week, winning by 38 in a game that just wasn't really competitive. I don't, I don't agree. I don't think the Cowboys are a bad football team, but I think they're a wild card team whose ceiling is probably the division series. Maybe a, they could make the conference championship game, but this they've definitely taken a step back from prior years. Well, they did have a pretty good win in Pittsburgh against the four and two Steelers. That was fun. Well. Russell Wilson will be making his debut tonight against Devontae Adams, who's debuting for the Jets. So that should be very interesting. Devontae Adams, you know, sort of just pouting in Oakland until he left. And now he's back with his old buddy, Aaron Rodgers, in New York. Is it the so, washed show, Garrett? Is the, the is politics the, the washed quarterbacks? The, the politics of sports, I think, sort of shine through with whatever even happened. Devontae Adams, first of all, he only went to, you know, the Raiders to be with Derek Carr. Derek Carr leaves. He wasn't really happy under any quarterback else there. So now he's back with his with his buddy Aaron in New York. We'll see how that goes. As the Bills are kind of starting to already run away with that division. It's just not a very good division outside Buffalo. The other three teams, not great. The Dolphins without Tua. Drake Mays, he's shown some promise in his first two starts, but the, the Patriots are they're a lot of talent away from being very competitive. 
And for the rest of the AFC, the Chiefs are undefeated, but they don't look amazing. No, they don't. We said this last year, and they won the Super Bowl. So yeah, we. It's we hard, just it's hard to be like, you know. I think you have to say the Chiefs are the best team in the league right now, but they're not as fun to watch as they were in previous years. And Mahomes doesn't look amazing. He's just making enough plays to win, and they're really relying on this defense like they did last year. We could say they're the best team in the league, but at the same token. From what we've seen, and it's a team that only has one loss, and they just beat the other undefeated team. The Detroit Lions, as much as I hate to say this, because I don't find I've you've, we've talked about how I don't find the Lions attractive like everybody else and their mother does. Um, I think they're playing like the best team in the NFL right now, and and that's that's something that I've seen from them. They look dominant, and you know they were they they fought today against Minnesota, but it's a Minnesota's a great team. They're they're a team that's undefeated, and Sam Darnold's a good quarterback now. And Kevin O'Connell's a great head coach in Minnesota too, and that's that's kind of it's kind of what's going on in the NFC North. It's a, it's a battle, and the Packers are in there, the Bears are in there. It's a very interesting division in football. Yeah, and Minnesota's been battle tested twice now in the division, winning in Green Bay, and then going to the ropes with the Lions, who you mentioned look like maybe the best team in the NFL. So I think it's you know pretty safe to say that the Vikings are for real. And they're going to be a contender in the NFC North. I don't think this is a fluke like we saw out of Josh Dobbs last year for a few game stretch. Kevin O'Connell really has Sam Darnold clicking. And you you mentioned the commanders in that in the NFC East. Besides that, there's not a, a whole lot of other teams jumping off the page. That the Buccaneers are four and two. The Seahawks are leading the division at four and three. The 49ers have looked really off without McCaffrey and then without Debo for most of the game today. It's I mean the Eagles are the Eagles are just you know they're sort of getting by at 4 and 2 but it feels like you know well, the Commanders are one of the best teams in in the NFC right now. Well, with 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 just a little bit less here, a little bit less than a minute here in our podcast, let's just get into it. As much as I've hated on the Cowboys, I'll gladly hate on the Eagles any day of the week. They're a train wreck right now. Nick Sirianni, Eagles fans have finally realized what I've been seeing the whole entire time. Nick Sirianni is a very unlikable guy. He's a guy with why I don't know why you even want him as your head coach. He does practically nothing. He doesn't call the plays. All he does is talk and yell at fans from the sideline. So the Eagles are in a bit of distress too. I you know what? They're not a good team either this year. The record might indicate a little bit better than Dallas. That's all right. It'll come crashing down for them in the end, which makes me feel just a little bit better about my whole situation in Dallas. Yeah. So you know you get your rant in about the Yankees, and then you get yours about the Cowboys too. Two different sides of the spectrum, but that'll do it. Here, this episode is, you know, we get closer to crowning an MLB champion and, you know, football's, it's fall, football's getting rolling. Stay tuned, everybody. Thank you.